Revelation chapter 7, verse 1. And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have ser sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed an hundred and forty-four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Of the tribe of Judah were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Gad were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Aser were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Nephthalim were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Manasses were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Simeon were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Levi were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Issachar were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Zebulun were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Joseph were sealed twelve thousand. Of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed twelve thousand. And after this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, these are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, no more neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any beast, sorry, nor any heat. For the Lamb, which is in the midst of the throne, shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of water, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. So here in uh, Revelation chapter 7, we begin to uh, find what happens immediately after what I'm going to prove to you is, is the tribulation period. This is a great time of suffering and of toil of the saints. At this time, they're going through the biggest hardship that men shall ever face, especially believers. Matthew chapter 24, and if you would, keep your finger in Revelation 7 and go to Matthew 24. And we'll go back and forth a little bit. Because in Matthew 24, the disciples came to Jesus and asked them very specifically, you know, what shall be the sign of your coming? And of the end of the word, tell us this, they said. And so Jesus answering began to give them this exhortation of, of the destruction to come in the last days. If you're to look in Revelation chapter 24, and verse 29, the Bible reads, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man coming in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. They shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with the sound of a great trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven unto the other. So here this, this point of the tribulation is very important because Jesus here uses it as a dividing line. He, he says, okay, what, everything I've told you is, is tribulation. Now he says, immediately after the tribulation shall these things come to pass. And what I grab a hold of is immediately after the tribulation, if you were to go to Revelation chapter 6, which is right before the context of chapter 7, what we're going to be learning about, you'll find in 6 and verse 12, it says, and I 
beheld, when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. So here we see the same thing that was mentioned in Revelation chapter 24, was a darkening of the sun and of the moon, likened as being black as sackcloth. Now you look at the sun today, and there's not blackness anywhere near that thing, right? So the, moon, the sun becoming black as sackcloth, and the moon the same thing. It's almost white as snow when it's up there. But now it's going to appear as blood, the Bible records. The next thing that you'll see, based on what we read in Rev, or Matthew chapter 24, was a shakening of, of the powers that be. In Revelation chapter 6 and verse 13, it says, And the stars fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And that goes on to begin to describe the kings of the earth seeing this great sight in heaven in verse 14, that it departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And this is the great awe-inspiring event that caused the rich and the powerful and the wealthy and every bondman and every free man and every man that remained at this time to literally go underground and beg that the rocks would fall on them because they would rather face the rocks than what is referred to in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 17. The great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? So, while back in Matthew 24, the one thing that you are missing from the context, in, in clear descriptive uh, language, we saw the blackening of the sun and moon, we saw the powers shaken, and the, and the stars falling, um, we don't see the sign of the Son of Man in specific context. But if you look back in Revelation 6, and verse 16, or in verse 14, it says, The heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their place. I believe that that is likened unto the sign of the Son of Man coming. And we've, we've never seen something like the sky literally peel back, roll together as a scroll, mountains and islands moving out of their place. I believe that that's the event where Christ appears in the clouds where Christ appears in his glory and that's exactly what it talks about the sign of the Son of Man in heaven coming that's the terrible sight because we literally see the men crying out for fear that they want to be hidden from the face of him so while the language is a little bit different you can see how after the tribulation these events happen which liken to the sixth seal in fact I believe that they match up perfectly tribulation closes out in verse 11 of Revelation chapters uh, six, and then begins the immediate events that will proceed the wrath of God appearing on this earth. And, and men knew, maybe they were inspired to make that statement, the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Wrath is come presently. It has arrived on the scene. It is come. It, it, it's not that it has come. It's not that it did come. It is presently just coming into our lives. And that's what he's, they're crying out for fear, these men. So, as we continue on, keep something there in Matthew chapter 24. We'll need it because we're going to go back and forth. And just have your finger there in 6 and have your finger in Revelation 6 and Matthew 24. <clears throat> we find that it continues on in this, this same sort of chronological order of things. We read that in Revelation chapter 7 and verse 1 when the Bible just clearly says, And after these things. So that means that everything that was preceding this event... Is, is He says, after these things. In other words, this happened, and now what is happening next is what I'm going to describe to you. Well, after what? Well, if we were to just put these two chapters that we've been reading together, just like it says, Matthew 24, immediately after the tribulation, the sun and moon are darkened, the moon shall not give its light. In Revelation chapter 6 and verse 12, the sun and moon are darkened, the moon shall not give its light. The great sign of the Lord appearing in the clouds, immediately after the tribulation of those days, is what's going to be described, almost just like, like, like sandwiched together. It's like they roll just from tribulation, and then that sign of the Son of Man coming, that great and terrible sight that causes men, and then what's going to follow that is, is what he's going to describe right here. So just as a quick look at, at what took part in that tribulation, I know I've done this before, but if you were to look in Matthew chapter 24, and we can use this a little bit as a guideline, in Matthew chapter 24 and in Revelation chapter 6, you find what I believe is the tribulation of those days. In Matthew 24 and verse 5, it says, Many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. 
In Revelation chapter 6, in verse 4, or in, in verse 2, it says there's a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And if you remember, we likened the description of that rider to being very similar to how Jesus reacts, but not the same. And so many Christs are coming, and there's a prominent white horse appearing as Christ. Back in Matthew chapter 24, and verse 6, and ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So wars and rumors of wars is the same thing that the red horse brings, if you remember, when he comes and he takes peace away from the earth. And when peace is removed from a body, people fight, and there's wars, and there's rumors of wars. In Matthew 24 and verse 7, it says, For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. That's just the continuation of the war as peace has been removed. And it says, And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. In other words, various places. Unusual places. We know that there's our famines and earthquakes uh, presently that happen in this world in just various different places. But this is describing almost a world wide cataclysm. Not those things were, were unusual or they never happened before. It's just saying they're, they're in different places. That's what diverse means. They're in different places than what we're used to. And that's exactly what you see with that black horse. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 5, the black horse comes and he has those balances in his hand. Remember how we saw that the rich were going to gain power and, and notoriety and they were going to be powerful, but there would be measures of wheat for a whole day's work sold. And so there was great famines. There was great sicknesses and illnesses that came because of the great poverty from the vast majority of people at this time. Now in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 8 and down, it says, these are beginnings of sorrows. They shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. Jesus has turned. He's now speaking directly to his disciples, his followers. And he's saying, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that endureth unto the end shall be saved. This is in verse 13. And that's what I believe is referred to in Revelation chapter 6. And in verse 8, when it talks about death. Death and hell following after death coming to this earth, given power over one-fourth part of the earth. And I believe that I preached a few weeks ago that that primarily, I believe, was to be Christians because verse 9 says that those that have the word of God or those that were slain were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And each one of these, it says, and they cried with a loud voice because after they were slain, where were they? They were in heaven with God. They cried and said, how long, Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell upon the earth? And so that's all caught up in what I believe in, is referring to the time of tribulation for the saints. It's going to come as kind of a worldwide sort of cataclysm and, and, and a horrible event. But I believe at some point during that time it's going to be spun to where men will just revile and hate specifically Christians. And a focus will be on the righteous saints and they are going to be the ones that are going to suffer the most hardship. Yeah, there's going to be lots of people dying in those times. One quarter part of the earth we wouldn't expect to be only the believers. There's probably much less than that. But one fourth part of the earth is going to be killed specifically in that pale horse time and those are going to be saints those are going to be those that have the testimony and those are going to be those that that eventually find themselves in heaven and in verse 11 of revelation 6 it says and white robes were given unto every one of them and it was said unto them that they should rest yet a little season until their fellow servants and their brethren should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. That should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So what he's talking about here is that the brethren will be killed in a similar fashion. In other words, it's, it's saying that it's got to be fulfilled. There's going to be an end to these things. But if we were to look back, the, say, the Bible says and records in Matthew chapter 24, um, in verse 22, it says, except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days should be shortened. So we expect something then to intervene at this time. We expect something to come and, and jump into the scenario to where, to where these Christians are removed from it. Matthew chapter 24 and in verse 12, the Bible says, because the iniquity 
shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold, but he that endureth unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. And we saw that playing out with the pale horse in Revelation chapter 6, where for the word of God and for the testimony which they had, they were being persecuted. But the Bible says, He that endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Now again, if you were to look over in verse 21 of Revelation 24, or Matthew 24, sorry, it says, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, no, ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then, if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not, for there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible they shall deceive the very elect. So this warning is coming and showing people that they need to believe on and to trust in the true Christ at this time. They need to rely on him only because there's going to be fake and phony and false Christ coming. In verse 26 it says, Wherefore if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, Go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers. Believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also be the coming of the Son of Man be. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For where the river the carcasses, thither will the eagles shall be gathered. So this is the time when the Son of Man is coming. And this is what I believe is the thing that will shorten those days to where not every single Believer, Not every single fleshly believer will be destroyed at this time, but rather there will be a vast majority of them, and then shall there be days shortened. That says in verse 22. And when are those days shortened? Just as lightning cometh out of the east, shineth unto the west, at the coming of the Son of Man. This is the promise that is made. And so he's saying, hey, those days shall be shortened. The Son of Man shall come in the clouds. He's going to gather together his elect. We read about in other places. And it says now, immediately after the tribulation. So this is what we're getting to now. When we turn the page from Revelation chapter 6, and that sixth seal being open, with the sun and moon being dark, and the moon not giving its light, the stars falling from heaven, the heart heaven departing as a scroll, men for fear going to the cave saying they don't want to see the face of the Son of Man who is now coming in the clouds, crying out the great day of his wrath is come, it just arrived, and who shall be able to see stand that's what's being referred to as we as we come into revelation chapter 7 and now revelation or matthew 24 and verse 29 it says immediately after the tribulation and all those events come to be so we see then the morning we see then Jesus coming in the clouds, or uh, at the Son of Man coming. We see the angels gathering his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven unto the other. And then it's very interesting that as soon as you come across what I refer to as tribulation in Revelation chapter 6, into Revelation chapter 7, we find four angels holding the four winds of the earth that they should not blow. So... What I believe is happening here is there is a stage being set for this gathering, for the shortening of the days. Tribulation is coming upon all of his saints. If it were possible, they'd be deceived, but they won't be. If it was possible, they will all be destroyed. But for the elect's sake, Christ is going to step in. So again, Revelation 6, tribulation. And then in that same context, Revelation chapter 6, we found it meshed with Revelation chapter 24. And you can go again and just walk through that. This is how I explained it to my wife the first time. The Bible makes it really easy. You just dance between these two pages, and you can just get those two contexts brought in together to where we get to the point. Yes, sun and moon darkened, morning, the sky departing. They're fearing his face as he comes in the clouds. So what we should expect then as we carry over into Revelation chapter 7, if all this lines up, and I believe that it does, we shall see what's referred to in verse 31 of Matthew 24. And he shall send his angels with the sound of a great trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, 
from one end of heaven unto the other. Now, if you go to Revelation chapter 7, I might park it there for a little bit now. In Revelation chapter 7, they're saying that he's removing his elect from the four winds. And then we find immediately these angels standing at the four corners of the earth, and they have power over these four winds. So doesn't that bring those same things into the immediate context when we're there? They have restricted these four winds. They have control over these four winds. And the Bible says... Um, they are holding, sorry, after these things I saw four angels standing in the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel, and here's what happens. So they're holding these things. After what we saw in tribulation, there's this great time of calm. Time of calm. No wind, not even a breeze going. It's being held back by these angels. They create this calmness. And in verse 2 it says, And I saw here another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. So they have power over the four winds. Now they have power to hurt the earth and the sea, but the angel, the one that has the seal of the living God upon him, cries out and says, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So what I believe this is indicating, and is while we did see lots of earthquakes and famines and pestilences and things happening to the earth, to the sea, that, that were, were bad things, right? They were hurtful things. We see that God here is showing us that these angels did not take part in it. These, these supernatural, heavenly, spiritual angels were not participating in that. And that's why I said that most of what was created tribulation-wise was not supernatural at all. It was simply men being wicked to men. Yeah, demonic possessed men, perhaps, doing wicked things to men at this time. But it was very earthly and carnal, the, the problems and suffering that they were going through. Until you get to the point of the sixth seal, where God then takes what's in the the sixth seal, unloosens it, so it comes out, right, our illustration, it was there, God comes, and he then has that great earthquake, he blackens the sun and moon, and, and then he begins to roll away the sky as the heavenly bodies fall as fig trees when they're shaken of the mighty wind, those untimely figs as it falls. And now you're starting to see the transition from carnal events to supernatural events. And so at that time, God has his angels hold back the winds, things pause for a moment. He cries with a loud voice and says, Don't hurt the earth, nor the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our, of our God in our forehead. So God's getting ready to set the stage for the next big event. And he says, And I heard the number of them which were sealed. So he's going to seal some men now. And there were sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. So there's a lot of uh, questions going back and forth about who these hundred and forty-four thousand Jews are. Oh, but wait, the Bible doesn't say Jews here now, does it? The Bible says of the tribes of Israel. So I don't need to go back and forth and debate and wonder and get all confused and mixed up about who I think that these people are. I believe 100% as the Bible is teaching, it says there's a hundred and forty-four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel, okay? So every tribe that existed back, um, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob became Israel, and he had the tribes after that that spread out from them, and they walked with Moses and all that. Of those tribes, 144,000 with 12,000 from every group was taken and sealed, giving an appropriate mark on them. God separated them out. So my observation about this, and it's easy to say, again, these aren't Jews. There's only 12,000, actually, of the Jews, right? The tribe of Judah. They're listed there first in Revelation chapter 5. But you also have Reuben. You also have Gad, Azer, Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Issachar. You have Zebulun. You have Joseph. You have Benjamin. Each one of those constituting 12,000 people that make up the whole 144,000. Remember back in uh, Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1, where it said, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And so from the time of Revelation 4 and verse 1, where John was 
brought up hither, where the angel said, come up hither to see this revelation unto where we're standing now in Revelation chapter 7. He hasn't went back down to earth. So what he is seeing is 12,000 of each tribe of Israel in heaven already who are being sealed. Amen. That's what he sees. He's standing there, and there is 144,000, 12,000 of each tribe being sealed. What I believe is that these were just Old Testament saints. This could have been the first Benjamin, the first Asa, the first Simeon. They could be one of those 12,000. Maybe their great-grandchild was one of them as well. Maybe their great-great-great. But either way, they were Old Testament. These aren't men presently on this earth <laughs> that, that are just going to be sucked up, brought together for some special... No, they were already in heaven. They had already passed away. They were already resurrected now. Sorry, no, they're already there in heaven. They're, they're waiting for the resurrection, but they're given a seal at this time. And they're marked, and they're separated, and they're special. We're going to learn more about them a little bit further on in Revelation. But what I really wanted to focus in on was the other group, okay? We already read through this. So this 144,000, not Jews, but rather of the tribes of Israel, um, that, that's where they came from. They're already there in heaven. Another thing that just tells me that, that this is the case is because you, you just don't have 12,000, I believe, of the tribe of Acer specific in that lineage even alive today. You, you don't have people that would say they are Jews, which they're not. You don't have them saying, I'm of this tribe, of that tribe. Some kind of boastfully will say that they do. But these things don't exist. These things had to have, have been fulfilled. These, these men had to have been picked out. At a, at a long time ago, they've already passed away, and now they're being marked and set aside. The servants of our God are being sealed in the foreheads, and that's who these are. So back to looking for the gathering together. Okay, so again, he has the four winds blocked off, these angels. And they're waiting for the sealing before they are going to hurt the earth. 12,000 of each tribe of the children of Israel are marked. And then, remember, this comes on the heels of tribulation. Sun and moon being darkened. The coming of Christ in the cloud. The day of his wrath has finally arrived. And now John in heaven says, after this I saw. And what does he see? These being light, these being marked, these being sealed. And then in verse 9, after this, there it is again. So this is just a chronological thing. After this, I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation! I'll leave it there for a moment. The Bible records that there is a great multitude, innumerable, no one can count them. And men have counted a um, hundred million is a number that's mentioned in the Bible. These could not be counted. These could not be numbered. And yet here they are standing before John. And he says this, all nations were present, all kindreds, all people, all tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb. And here they are clothed in white robes with palms in their hands and they're crying out this, salvation! That's the first thing they're going to say, right? The first thing that's going to come out of their mouth as soon as they're there is salvation! Salvation! To our God which sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb. Salvation is what they cry out. You know who these are? All nations, kindreds, tongues. This is everybody. This is another thing that I will tell you that, hey, today on this earth is not existing all nations that have ever existed, right? Nations have passed away. They've been destroyed. They, they, right? Are all kindreds and tongues here? What about all tongues? How many languages die off every single year as we almost amalgamate into just one language? English being the mother tongue of the whole world. At least a very prominent second language as, as, as more and more just die off and die off and die off. Some languages are extinct. Some nations are extinct. Peoples, Kindreds, tongues have, have all passed away. So it's saying, the Bible is saying, all nations, if they're present together then, come from all times of all earth that have ever been existed, from the time of Adam until where we stand today, until when this event comes to pass. People will be taken and be presented before the Lamb and before God at this time, and they will stand there as a great multitude, innumerable by men, and the first thing they're going to cry out is, Salvation! 
salvation. <laughs> salvation. Doesn't this line up with what we saw in Matthew chapter 24 when it says that they were coming and they were going to gather together his elect from the four winds and from one end of earth of heaven unto the other. That's in uh, Revelation chapter 24 and in verse 31. Got to put my bookmark back. <clears throat> so the first thing that these cry out again is salvation. If you look over in verse 11, it says, And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders, and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces, and worshipped God, saying, Amen! Blessing, and glory, and wisdom, and thanksgiving, and honor, and power, and might be unto God forever and ever. Our God! Amen! Now, if we need to look further to clarify what's going on here, I can make the pronunciation right now and just say, you know what? I believe that this is just the saints that were raptured, right? These were just men that were all caught up and carried away. We can see in the context, it's just very clear that there's 144,000 Jews being numbered from a time perhaps before Christ even walked this earth. And now there is a great multitude innumerable of every kindred, tongue, and people. It's, it's, it's all the people that came after the gospel went out on the day of Pentecost unto all those nations, kindreds, and tongues, and people. And now they're being gathered together. The first thing that they want to cry out is salvation. Back in Revelation chapter 7, and in verse 13 it says, And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in right robes, and whence came they? So one of these elders comes forward to John, who had just seen this sight of the selecting of the 144,000. They were sealed. And then finally there's a great multitude clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. And the elder comes to him and says, Hey, who are these people and where did they come from? <laughs> who are all these people and where did they come from? And John is like, I have no idea. I just got here. He says, Surely you know. Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of of the Lamb. These are they which came out of great tribulation. Isn't this what we were just talking about was being described in Revelation chapter 6? Isn't this what the Bible was describing in Matthew 24 as that, that time which no man had ever known and except those days should be short, there should no flesh be saved but for who? The elect's sake shall those days be shortened and here we find an a, a elder standing with a, a preacher, standing with John the Apostle and he's like, who in the world are all these people where did they came from they came out of great tribulation now they're washed now they're clean now they are white with the blood of the lamb and it's amazing that the first thing that these would cry out would be salvation i mean some of these the bible records were alive and remained after seeing their family members destroyed after seeing their loved ones destroyed their church family ripped to pieces and destroyed at the hands of a wicked government who is leading this great uh, insurrection of, of destruction upon Christians. The, the Bible said that there should no flesh be saved if the elect, if it wasn't for the elect's sake. And here, those days are shortened. And when they finally arrive in, in heaven here, and they see the apostle John standing there, and all these elders, and all these singing salvation and glory and praise, that's what they cry out. They see salvation. They've now seen those loved ones who died before them. They're now seeing those ones who, who suffered before them. They're seeing the lost ones now standing clean and white in the blood of the Lamb. And they were those, the Bible says, who came out of great tribulation. Go with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I'll finish up in Revelation chapter 8. In 1 Thessalonians, i got to find it now. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We find another take on this event. It's interesting how, how, how they, they're standing up there and he says, hey, there, there, there was, how is it said? He says, after this, I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number. And they arrived in such a case that over in verse 13, the elder says, what are these which are arrayed in right robes, and whence came they? So that great multitude arrived and an elder who had been there 
for, for perceivably millennia, who knows how long this elder had been there. He, he was familiar because he was always there praising God. He was sitting at the, at the table before God, right? He goes, who are these people and where did they come from? And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and in verse 14 it says, For if we believe, and that's important, if we believe, right? Whosoever believeth hath life, right? If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, in the same way, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. The Thessalonian church was one that was going through a time of tribulation that would pale in comparison to what's happening at the end times being described in Revelation. And yet they felt as if they were there to the point where some were wondering, when is the Lord coming? They're almost crying the same thing. How long, Lord, will thou allow this to go on? And the apostles writing unto them, and he says, if we believe, if you believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Okay, he's bringing comfort to these to say that your loved ones will be brought. If you believe even so as they believe, you'll go together. For this we say, verse 15, unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are al alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. The coming of the Son of Man. The sign of the Son of Man. What? Coming in the clouds was described in Matthew chapter 24. We brought that forward to the context of Revelation chapter 6 with ease because the Bible makes these things plain. I understand I'm flipping around a lot and that might get a little bit confusing, but if we just align these scriptures one by one, we can see that they just mesh. They just go together. They're describing the same event. They're describing the coming of the Lord. And the Bible says that we that are alive and remain, who are those that alive and remain? Those that, those that... For the elect's sake, there was flesh saved, right? Except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. That's what said in Matthew chapter 24. These ones, he's describing, they're alive and they remain unto what? The coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. In other words, shall not go before them which are asleep. Why? Because verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Why won't we prevent them if we're alive and remain? Because the dead in Christ are going to arise first at the trump, at the voice of the archangel. And verse 17 says, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. This is a message of comfort because it's describing a time of such great tribulation and suffering that people are going to be at a loss as to what to even do. They've lost their family. They've lost their friends. They've lost their security. They've lost their loves. They've lost everything, it seems. And they're just waiting and praying for the return of of Christ their Savior, and at the time they may be feeling woe, they may be feeling concerned, they may feel like they'll never see their loved ones again, and yet Paul says, and be of comfort. They're going to rise first. They have a resurrection coming. When they do, you'll meet them in the air. And that's why the Bible so clearly outlines that there is going to be a great multitude, which no man can number of every kindred, of every peoples, of every tongue throughout all time, arriving at the same time in the air and being in heaven with the Lord forever, as it describes in verse 17. And shall we ever be with the Lord? And if you continue down into the context of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and now into chapter 5, which too often people fail to do, it says, But, but of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you, okay? For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. And now if we were to stop there, we could say, well, there's something that would support that imminent catching away. No tribulation, nothing to worry about, no suffering, no family members lost, no, no, no waiting until the day for that, for that last little moment before the last few people are destroyed, yet for the elect's sake, those should be we could dismiss all of those and say, well, he's coming as a thief in the night. 
Well, whenever somebody tries to tell me that, I can just confidently say, okay, that's fine for you. But if you continue reading, it says, For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. So Paul is differentiating right here. He says, Yourselves know perfectly the day of the Lord cometh as a thief in the night. Who's it come upon? Well, when they're saying peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon believers? No. Upon Christians? No. Upon the audience that I'm writing to? No. He says, It cometh upon them. And travail will come upon them, and they shall not escape. And verse 4 says, But ye who? Brethren! Ye brethren are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are the children of light, and the children of the day. And ye are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that be drunken, are drunken in the night. But let us, who? Believers, brethren, let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing that who? Them. Then they which shall say peace and safety when they've destroyed all the Christians. Then they which shall say, hey, we, we've finally gotten rid of them. Then when they shall say peace and safety when they're in their mountain huts, when they're crying out, the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? Then when they come to that point, then we are free. Ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief, but it's overtaking the unbelievers as a thief. It's overtaking those that believe not, that have hid themselves in the dens and the rocks, those that are hiding from the face of the Lamb. When everything is bad, when everyone's suffering, when everyone's hurt, when you've lost family members, who in the world who's a believer is going to be hiding their face from the Lamb? Nobody. They're going to be crying for him to come out. They're going to be rejoicing when they see him come in the clouds. When they see Christ finally arrive. And the Bible says that God hath not appointed us to wrath, which is about to come in the context of Revelation chapter 8. God hath not appointed us to wrath. That was announced in chapter 6 and verse 17 when he said the great day of his wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand? God hath not appointed us to wrath. But what did he appoint us to? To obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. It's describing a last day's time where God says, Hey, I haven't appointed you unto wrath. But you know what? The Christians have lots of persecution, tribulations. All ye that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, shall suffer tribulation, trouble at the hands of the unbeliever. But God didn't appoint us unto wrath. But what did he appoint us unto? Well, it says in Revelation chapter 7 and verse 9, there's a great multitude, innumerable, all nations, kindreds, and peoples, and tongues that will stand before him with the dead in Christ rising first. And what's the thing that they're going to cry out? They're not appointed unto wrath, but they're appointed to salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. Salvation is what they're appointed to obtain at this time. And many other promises that go along with that. Immediately with God, clothed in white robes, palms in your hands. Now you can celebrate or maybe fan yourself off a little bit. I don't know what those would be for, but perhaps just to lay before our Savior. But in verse 15 of chapter 7 it says, Therefore are they, so we're appointed to obtain salvation. The Bible says that these came out of great tribulation. They came out of that great time of trouble. They came out of Revelation chapter 6, which was all just a build up of unsealings where God was allowing men to finally have their way with the Christians. But God wasn't going to just sit by and let that happen. No, he had something better prepared. Yes, for those that were alive and remain, but also for the dead in Christ, who are now at rest and who would be raised up. He said, therefore they who came out of great tribulation, they who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of Lamb, therefore they before the throne of God, and here's one of those blessed promises that we have, is we'll be before the throne of God. We'll finally be before our Lord. We can bow our knee in our prayer closet and step boldly before the throne of grace, but that's just something that we have to imagine in our minds. But finally, at this time, we'll be before the throne of God. We'll finally be there. The Bible says, and serve him 
day and night in His temple, we'll have the opportunity to serve the Lord and see His smiling face when we please Him. See His smiling face when we bring Him joy. See a tear fall in His eyes as He says, I'm proud of you, daughter. I'm proud of you, son. We can serve Him day and night in His temple. The Bible says in the third point, and He that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. And won't that be great to dwell with Jesus? Won't that be great to be with your Lord? Hey, the world can have their joy right now. Now. They can have everything that they want right now. But God is what we want. And we will finally dwell with him. And he will dwell among us. Amen. Verse 16 says, They shall hunger no more, neither thirst anymore. Neither shall the sunlight on them, nor any heat. Finally, there's that crisp... It's just that perfect comfort, the satisfaction of not being not being too hot in the summer or too cold in the winter, like we are as Canadians quite often. We won't be hungry. We won't be thirsty. What a blessing to be before the throne. What a blessing to serve the Lord and to have Him dwelling among us and to be completely satisfied therewith. Why? Verse 17, for the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them. And he shall lead them to living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. The Bible says, except those days should be shortened, there shall no flesh be saved. It's such a time of trouble and tribulation and anguish. If we're alive to see those days, and I believe we are, I believe those days are coming. It's getting wickeder and wickeder out there in the world. And it's getting to the point where you can just see some of these seals being opened. You see rap stars coming forward and saying, I found Jesus, and then making themselves into Jesus. Right? Coming forth and saying, as, as a rider on a white horse, that I am some Christ. And then there's going to be men saying, here is Christ. Well, there is Christ. False Christs are going to be arising all around us. And more and more and more we see wars and rumors of wars. We see the, the foretellings of all the scriptures that are described in Revelation chapter 6. But one of these days, God's going to just open those seals and we'll, we'll see the, the complete wickedness of human nature completely unreleased. God restricting that from coming out. And then finally, he just lets it go. And it gets to a threshold where men despise God. God and despise God's people and they are destroyed and they are destroyed and they are destroyed and except those days should be shortened but that's the promise that we look for that's the reason why we don't mourn as do others when our loved ones who are saved pass away that's why we don't mourn as do others when we see tribulation at our doorsteps we need to look forward to those days being shortened when we will finally be before the throne of God when we will finally be able to serve him day and night in his temple when we will finally see Sit with him and he'll be among us, dwelling with us. And he will finally wipe every tear from our eyes. So what was the charge that we were given? The charge is that while we are here, we're to watch and be sober. We're to watch and be sober. Watch. What I say unto you, I say unto all. Watch. That's what Jesus said to his disciples in Mark. And I can show you that. Let's go to Mark, the, uh, Mark chapter 13. So Matthew chapter 24 is a parallel with Mark chapter 13. A lot of people will say, just like they'll say, oh, it's, it's the Jews that are 144,000. They're dead wrong. But they'll say that Matthew is just talking to the disciples in 24. Or they'll say that Matthew is just talking to Jewish people in 24. Not to believers, not to Christians, not to every kindred nation and tongue who's ever believed in Christ. But after he gives that same exhortation from a different perspective. Mark records this interesting thing in Mark chapter 13. And in verse 37, go to verse 35. He says, Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even or at midnight, or the cock crowing, or in the morning. And remember the charge from Thessalonians was to watch and be sober. He says, Lest coming, suddenly he find you sleeping. That's a spiritual sleep. That's, that's not just if you're asleep, you're going to somehow miss out on what's going on here. Just, just, just watch. You don't know when the master is coming. Referring to, in the context, the end days. Referring to, in the context, the time when, when except those days should be shortened, you're going you're to be slain in your living room. If you even have a home over your head at that time. He says, watch ye therefore, in verse 37, and what I say unto you, just in case we think he was just talking to his disciples. What I say unto you, I say unto all. Watch. Okay? That, that word all gets, gets truncated and spit upon and knocked over. And, and Calvinists just love taking all out of 
you know, John 3.16. And God doesn't love the whole world. He just loves those that, that have believed. Calvinists are, are wicked people. And one of these days, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just tear them open. <laughs> I'm waiting for that one. What I say unto you, I say unto all. Remember, all nations, all kindreds, all tongues, all people that are standing before the throne at that great time when the, the angel's like, who are these and where did they come from? It was all, it was all, it was all. And that's what Jesus is saying. Hey, this is being said to you, disciples, but I'm saying it to all. I'm saying it to everybody. Watch. And this is our charge in the last days. These things about scripture, prophecy, about Bible prophecy, the last days, some of us may put it off as kind of boring, maybe intellectual stuff, maybe things we don't need to worry about, maybe just, just something for, for the college student or something. I don't know. I don't know why you would dismiss this. It's interesting to me, but some people dismiss Bible prophecy. But the purpose of it is to get us fired up and get us focused. Whenever Jesus gives prophecy preaching, he always says, hey, watch and be sober. Watch unto prayer. Watch, be prepared, be ready. And the more we learn about Bible prophecy, the more that when Jesus starts releasing these seals upon this world, when Jesus starts opening up so that men can finally, in the fullness of their wicked hearts, just, just do as they please to their own self-glory, their own self-gratification, when he finally allows for that an Antichrist would step up, rise up, take over this whole world and turn them against believers, we're not going to be shocked by it. We're not going to be of those that are asleep. We're not going to be the drunken that are drunken in the night. Those that are asleep that are asleep in the night. He says, you, brethren, are not as they are. They're going to suffer and, and die and be destroyed by the wrath of God. But I've appointed you to obtain salvation. So watch for these things. Watch for these things. Be sober. Be focused. Keep your mind clear. Don't be a drunken idiot. Watch. Be prepared. Be, be focused. Watch what I say unto you. I say unto all. Watch, he said. Dear Lord, I thank you.